thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Ijaz Saab, and all of the wonderful people here uh, on the stage and in the audience. It, it really is a privilege to come here and speak with you. Unfortunately, I have to be out of here in about 10 minutes, so it will be brief, which is also good for you. You will hear a brief speech. Um, uh, but I, I came here thinking what I'll talk about. I'm not really a CEO of a corporate sector company, so my uh, my lessons may not apply to you. My journey uh, may not be relevant to what you're trying to do. Uh, but let me start out by telling you a story which I've recently read, which I found very interesting. It's a story worth taking home, especially by the younger people in this audience. Also, in my defense, I'm losing hair very quickly. Whoever said that. And, and, and my hair are also graying out very quickly. Uh, and, uh, and that's also because of, you know, just the line of business I find myself in. Here is uh, here's the story. The story is that, uh, as most of you would be aware, WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook about a year ago, a couple of years ago. Now that is well known, that WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook. What's not well known is that the deal was not signed either at the Facebook headquarters or at the WhatsApp headquarters. The deal was signed, which I find very intriguing while reading about this. The deal was actually signed in a social security office, actually an abandoned old social security office, close to an abandoned old railway station in Orange County in California. So that was very intriguing. When I, when I read that piece of information, I was very intrigued on why that happened. The deal, $18 billion deal, $18 billion is a lot of money. That's Punjab's budget five times over or something like that. The $18 billion deal was not signed at the Facebook headquarters or at the WhatsApp headquarters. It was signed at a social security office close to an abandoned railway station in Orange County. So I started digging deep to find out why that was the case. And this is the story that I found out. It's a very inspirational story. It's a story of the CEO of WhatsApp. His name is Jang Kuhn, uh, somewhere from one of the Russian states. He moved to US uh, when he was four years old with his mother. And because they didn't have money to provide for themselves, he used to queue up in that social security office for food stamps with his mother. So about 18, 20, or 30 years ago, he used to queue up in front of that social security office for food stamps, so that he and his mother could eat. His mother shortly after died of cancer. His dad couldn't move to US because of uh, travel bans and restrictions. So he was all by himself. He washed toilets in McDonald's and Wendy's and places of those sorts. And then eventually came up with an, then got a job at Yahoo for four years at some stage, couldn't finish college. And then at some stage come up with an idea to do a Facebook-like social network, except that it works with your address book on your cell phone. And that's where the name came from, WhatsApp. It's actually a, a, a play on the word WhatsApp, which was just a status update so that other people in your address book can also read uh, what you're doing. So whether you're going to eat or sleep or going to a gym or whatever, you could set a little status update and your friends in your address book could find out what you're trying to do. It didn't seem like an awfully inspiring idea at the time, given that Facebook, etc., were already around. And also, when he thought of this, Android and iPhone had not happened yet. So he started building this on a Windows phone. And for about two to three years, started building this platform, just that this wouldn't work, because Windows just wouldn't allow an application like that to actually work seamlessly. But he plowed on for good about two to three years. Many times, uh, you know, he was he considered leaving, he was told that's a stupid idea and he should move on and do something else, but he kept at it. Eventually iPhone happened and he built an application that from status updates went to messaging and, and then is now used by about a billion people in the world. That's as many people as, 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 as the population of China or India. And, and eventually was acquired for $18 billion. But the, the venom the grudge that he kept with the system, the grudge that he had with, with, with what was trying to hold him back in the system, he eventually overcame that and took out that grudge in a very interesting way by signing the deal that changed his fate <coughs> and the fate of his company in a place that still haunted him, which was the Social Security Office 
where he used to queue up 30 years ago for food stamps. This you can only do, unfortunately, as an IT entrepreneur. We've never really heard stories from US or anywhere else where someone out of absolutely nowhere set up a spinning mill or someone from absolutely nowhere set up a sugar refinery or an oil refinery because it takes billions of rupees to set something up like that. In fact, in post-colonial countries like ours, most of this was given out as charity and handouts by our colonial masters. And in many ways, the common man in this country is still trying to catch up with that. The people in this country who were handed out at the time of creation of this country, tens of billions of rupees of property and permits and licenses and unfair advantages that the common man in this country cannot seem to catch up with. But IT gives you an opportunity to actually catch up. You could actually come up with a great idea, a disruptive idea, start a company, keep at it with a small team, and actually make much more money than a spinning mill ever would in a country like Pakistan. That is the force of high-tech entrepreneurship. That's why we all hear stories about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Jan Koom and Elon Musk. They are the entrepreneurs that we talk about because they were the ones who out of nowhere, as common men, came up with great ideas and through their enterprise innovation disrupted the economy, disrupted the status quo and made lots of money for themselves, but also for the system that they find themselves in. So I, I heavily believe in this. I believe that uh, the future of Pakistan lies in innovative, disruptive ideas. About four to five years ago, we started a startup incubator at Plan 9, at, at PITP called Plan 9, which has now graduated about 130 startups, one of which is Sajjad's startup. Sajjad started with Thai Lakh Rupiah in a consulting business that got set up and is now a $15 million business. And then we'll see the $15 million business. Sajjad did not receive any charity land from our colonial masters when they were leaving the country. Neither did his dad or his granddad. He did not get any unfair license or any unfair loan from a bank that he chose never to pay up. He did it all by himself. He worked hard. He had a great idea. He's a common man like you and me. He had Thai Lakh Rupiah when he started his company and now runs a company of $15 million worth of revenue every year. That is where the future of Pakistan lies. The future of Pakistan does not lie with what we have to confront in this country at this point in time. The future of this country lies in young people, people who were born here, mostly after the Ziyaira, they have their own identity, and they're fighting to bring about change in this country. That is the future of this country. That's the disruption that is happening in the society. A lot of people don't see, this, see that coming, but everything in this country is changing fundamentally. The 60% of this population is below the age of 30. That's incredible. You go to US or Japan, these are aging countries. It's exactly the other way around. 60% of the population is above the age of 30. In Pakistan, 60% of the population is below the age of 30. Very few of them are represented in this room. But that is where the future of this country is. Those are the people who are going to disrupt the status quo, hopefully using technology, and change this country fundamentally from what we were given about 50 years ago by large land grants and charities and permits and loans that put a very small number of people at an unfair advantage in this country. So that's going to go away. This country is going to get disrupted big time. As I was sitting here, Ijaz Saab said something interesting. He said, you are disrupting the government at this point. And we are very happily in Punjab. We are blessed with the chief minister uh, who really wants to drive change, who wants to make changes happen in the government. And it's relentless. Uh, he's not someone who backs out easily. He's someone who's always driving forward, always fighting with the status quo, always fighting with the system. And, uh, and in Punjab, we have actually come a long way in disrupting a lot of uh, things that were, some that were good about 150 years old. I remember when I was fighting with the 
with the stamp paper mafia. We just recently in Punjab changed the Stamp Paper Act. Now you can no longer go to the Treasury office and buy a stamp paper. You have to go to a private bank where uh, they'll automatically figure out how much tax you owe to the government for a profit transaction and give you what is called an electronic trans uh, stamp paper. This electronic stamp paper has an electronic ID. You can verify it using SMS. Uh, when you buy it, all the record is kept electronically at your blockchain. If I saw someone here who's, who's working on blockchain. So all that record is kept digitally, electronically. You can't change it. You can't buy a backdated stamp paper. You can't forge a stamp paper. You can't go to court because you want to dispute the stamp paper. The entire transaction actually has an electronic record. It took us literally about three months to do. It's not hard to do. Uh, but the stamp paper act was the, the, the stamp paper act for which we were fighting it was dated 1851. So put about what uh, that's the stamp paper act that Pakistan had been using, you know, for the last 70 years. Took us three months to do it. We decided that we don't want the stamp papers around. A lot of court cases, frivolous court court cases, come from uh, you know these kind of transactions. A lot of housing societies in Pakistan use basically just forged stamp papers, jelly stamp papers. A lot of time when we are doing property transactions, we don't want to declare the actual value. Instead, we want to lie to the government and actually pay lesser tax than what is due for the government. And that you can do because you can bribe the treasury officer. He's a lowly government employee, he has a very small salary, but he has to make decisions of billions of rupees every day. So he's decided to benefit from that equation also. So you can go and bribe a treasury officer and uh, who are typically worth in billions themselves, just so that you could declare a smaller tax than what is actually due to the government. So we took him out of the equation, and now you have to go to Bank of Punjab or any other private bank. You tell them about the house address that you have. They have an automatic calculator through which they find out what the stamp paper duty should be if you're transacting your property, and, and, and all the record is kept electronically. And for the first time in the history of Punjab, we're going to exceed the revenue gener generation target that we set for Board of Revenue uh, good, by good about 30 to 40 percent, which basically means that about 30 to 40 percent of the stamp papers were essentially forged in this country. Let that sink in a little bit. In a country where it is a big crime to, to print, uh, to, to, to print uh, fraudulent currency notes, but a currency note can only be as big as 5,000 rupees. A stamp paper could be as big as 25,000 rupees. Could about 30 to 40 percent of these were forged. You know, that's the country that we live in. But that's the deception that this country also needs, which is quickly happening. So I, I, yeah, I've, I've come here to deliver the good or the bad news, depending on which side of the equation you are in, that, <laughs> that we cannot stop this anymore. You cannot stop this. I cannot stop this. This is certainly happening. Okay. The broken, corrupt, dilapidated country that existed for decades is going to change very quickly. And it is the young people tech-savvy, young, hungry, foolish people, younger than you, are going to make this happen. That's about 60% of this country. In about five, 10 years, everything in this country would have changed. The politics of this country would change. The business of this country would change. The demands of people in this country would change. The standards of service delivery will change. And if we don't change it, we'll be thrown out. And history has shown us that that is how it plays out. My, the reason I gave you John, Jan Hoon's example is I think that's going to play out in Pakistan also. Of the 130 companies that we graduated from Plan 9, our startup incubator, you know, good about 45 <coughs> companies now look like businesses that could become $100 million businesses. Two of them look like businesses that could become a billion dollar businesses. Imagine that's a lot of money. You know, that really is a lot of money if there were two, two or three companies each exiting with a billion dollars. This country would change. The other thing that I came here to talk to you about is, is the fact that, uh, that what worries me, and this I say with all the humility, is the fact that the largest IT company in Pakistan is about six to 700 people, employs about six to 700 people. The largest IT company in India employs 350,000 people. 
That's not just in IT, but in their businesses also. Some of my family is connected to traditional businesses, and I keep asking them, where are the Tatas and Bildas of Pakistan? Every country has those kind of businesses that do nation building, that change the country. Where are the Tatas and Bildas of Pakistan? These, these countries are only, you know, India is about seven times bigger than Pakistan. That equation should hold. But with 700 people versus 350,000 people, that's not seven times bigger. You know, that's what, 700 times bigger. What is going on? What are our corporate CEOs doing in Pakistan? Why are we not scaling? Where are those businesses that are going to change this country? Why don't we see that? So I come here to ask you that question also, as, as, as corporate CEOs, that we need to see the Tata's and builders of Pakistan. We want to see the TCSs and the Infosys and Wipro's of Pakistan. Why is that not happening? What excuse do you have? I don't understand this. You know, why do we only have a software company that employs 700 people as the largest IT company in Pakistan? Where is a company that employs 100,000 people, or 50,000 people, or 30,000 people? Why is that not happening? You owe me an answer. You owe these 60% young people population in Pakistan an answer at this point. Okay? Whatever it is, we really need to go out and make this happen. And if we don't, we'll be thrown out. Because there's younger, hungrier, and, and people with more drive, more vendetta, and more venom preparing to do it. That's 60% of your population. That's what brought me here today. Thank you so much. It was such an honor and privilege to talk to you. Closing uh, 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 poem or title or style, so I will appreciate as any poem of optimism for this country, sir. Well, it's uh, it's not as much optimism as it is more of what I've just said. So here is what it is then. Uh, this is from Faz, and this is one of my favorite poems of Faz. He wrote this quote about, what, 30, 40 years ago? Unfortunately, it's still true. So here we go. Aayye haath uthaye hum bhi. Hum jinhe rasme dua yaad nahi. Hum jinhe soze mohabbat ke siwa koi put, koi khuda yaad nahi. Aayye arz guzaren ke nigare hasti zahre maruz me shiri niye farta bharte. वो जिन्हें ताबे गराबारी अयाम नहीं उनकी पलकों पे शबो रोज को हल्का करते जिनकी आंखों को रुखे सुबह का यारा भी नहीं उनकी रातों में कोई शम्मा मुनव्वर करते जिनके कदमों को किसी राह का सहारा भी नहीं उनकी नजरों पे कोई राह उजागर करते जिनका दीन पैर भी एक किस्बो राया है उनको हिम्मत कुफर मिले जुर्रत तहकीक मिले जिनके सर मुंतजर तेग जफा है उनको दस्ते कातिल को झटक देने की तोफीक मिले इश्क का सिर नेहा जान तपा है जिससे आज इकरार करें और तपिश मिट जाए हरफ हक दिल में खटकता है जो कांटे की तरह आज इजहार करें और खलिश मिट जाए